Martina, what, what about uh, the Unimed Week? We just started today with the um, uh, presentation, I mean, an introduction and a welcome from our director, and then the very first webinar, which was with the uh, but, uh, uh, European Action, uh, External Action Service. I did not receive any emails uh, on this. Okay. Could you send me, you know, the, the, the program the so program, I can Of course, can of course. Register. It was okay. in our last newsletter, but I would ask my colleague from the communication okay. department. Thank you very much. Again. Of course, of course. Thank you. Yeah, you need to be registered to our newsletter in order to receive our email. Here with me today is my colleague Federica De Giorgi from the UNIMED team. <laughs> So I'm one. to introduce her to everyone. She's actually nice to... today because I was alone. <laughs> nice to meet you. And I start uh, nice. today by apologizing for my background noises. I'm alone at home with three kids today. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to manage both work and, uh, <laughs> and the kids. But if you hear some noises, unfortunately, it's me. So I can't really ask you to be a little patient with, with, with this. <laughs> I'll do, I, I'm trying my best to uh, keep them calm, but as you know, it's not always an easy task. <laughs> it's, it's indeed the most difficult task. So if you agree, I think we can maybe start with some greetings and with, uh, with our webinar. Uh, thank you, first of all, for everyone for being connected with us today and joining this conversation. This is our third webinar of the subnetwork on uh, safety and security and critical infrastructures. So the conversation goes on. We had uh, a, first, a very first webinar on uh, water and water infrastructures. And then we had a second webinar uh, on uh, um, cyber, cyber physical systems. And today we faced the topic, which is uh, I think one of the most relevant topics in our times of health infrastructure and pandemic management. Um, I want to share the greetings of our director, Marcello Scalisi, which couldn't be with us uh, today. As uh, Professor Ficarella mentioned, we just opened the UNIMED Week, which is one of our uh, institutional annual events. Uh, it's the UNIMED Week in Brussels. Usually we actually travel to Brussels at the European institutions and have the um, sessions uh, there. Uh, unfortunately, in the past couple of years, it was impossible to travel there, so we held the, the Unimed Week online, and as we are doing in 2021. Um, maybe I can share in the chat or share later on, uh, but you also find it on our website. There is a full program of uh, webinars and events uh, involving some agencies of the European Commission and some of our subnetworks uh, and some of our partners. Uh, to discuss about the Mediterranean in uh, many different aspects and in many different perspectives. So we hope it will be of interest of our associated universities and I will maybe share some details with you. Um, due to this commitment, this institutional commitment, our director was fully booked and fully busy. And so he sent his greetings and, uh, well, and uh, wants to um, encourage this 
webinar uh, on such an interesting and important topic. Um, I would like to uh, then give the floor to our subnetwork coordinator, Professor Antonio Ficarella from the University of Salento, uh, and also send the greetings, I would say so, um, unless then she, she's able to join. Um, the idea of this webinar was that came from the University of Salento and from Professor Ficarella and Professor Antonella Longo. Uh, she had a family issue and she couldn't be today uh, with us. She was supposed to moderate, but she had uh, also a particular interest in, in this specific topic. So she apologized for not being here, but you know, family is family. So she had another commitment and I will try to replace her at my best. Uh, I'm not an expert at all in the topic, so you will forgive me if I'm not fully familiar with uh, the conversation, but I will try to at least moderate the, the interventions and the session. So, Professor Ficarella, the, the floor is yours. So, good, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Al salam alaikum. Uh, I am happy uh, for this. Uh, uh, opportunity for this uh, for our meetings uh, as i told you during the previous uh, meetings i think that is very very important that we will become a real research and academic community as i told you sharing i don't know for example uh, the supervising of our uh, thesis of our phd thesis and also in the view uh, to participate uh, uh, to some founding programs. Now in Italy, I, as in other uh, European countries, uh, uh, for the due to the recovery plans the, after um, um, pandemic recovery plans, uh, we can have some opportunity uh, to found to to found um, um, some uh, financial financial support for as I told you for PhD programs as well as for three years research programs. Those programs, uh, uh, they these programs, uh, those programs are uh, necessarily uh, uh, should be characterized by an international point of view. So I think that we can share with you this. Uh, possibilities. As I told you, uh, my, my guess, my idea is that we should become real, we, sh we should become a, an academic uh, community uh, where we can share all our uh, experience, experiences. I would like to underline that uh, there are future webinars. Uh, the next one in regarding natural disasters and the crisis management and the following webinar on November regarding digital twins. That is a very important technology for the security of the physical infrastructures, digital twins in energy ecosystems. So I think that we will found a lot of opportunities to discuss about those topics and to found common opportunities to collaborate. Uh, and um, again, thank you very much to everybody. And now uh, uh, we can continue with the, the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ficarella. And so all, all the greetings are done so we can start with the real conversation. So the very first session of the webinar is for the subnetwork members, let's say, is a more of a an internal session which presents some experiences on behalf of our associated universities. So we will have represented the University of Cyprus, the University of Salento, and then the University of Cres of Montes e Alto Duoro. Forgive my pronunciation. <laughs> um, so we start with the University of Cyprus is Professor Christos Claudias, which will be our speaker for the day. Um, sharing with us um, a speech on COVID tracer exposure notification contact tracing. So, Professor Laudias, the floor is yours. And you can speak in English if you wish. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, Martina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to be here today with you. Glad to, to meet you all. So, let me try 
uh, and, and share uh, my screen. Uh, unfortunately, it will be in English. Sorry for that. So you have to wait until I not practice. In Salento, my... Not in Salento language. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let me know if you can see my uh, presentation in full screen now. Yes, very well. Okay, good. So, uh, like I said, I'm Christos Laudias. I'm a research lecturer at the KIO Center of Excellence, the University of Cyprus. Uh, and uh, today's presentation will be about the cold tracer exposure notification uh, application that we rolled out for uh, a contact tracing um, against the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I, uh, for this project that started about a year ago, I am the, the technical uh, coordinator. So the outline of my presentation, um, first I will give you a, a short background about the digital contact tracing, the uptake of applications and the effectiveness according to recent studies. Uh, then I will uh, uh, talk about the um, system architecture of the COV Tracer um, uh, EN in short uh, application and how we make it, uh, how we made it a part of the contact tracing ecosystem. Uh, in, in order to come up with um, a health infrastructure for the pandemic management. And then with some, um, I will elaborate on some security considerations in the system uh, design that I guess is of uh, more interest to, to this community. Now, uh, um, I guess in the past few months, uh, we all became familiar with uh, the, uh, what we call the manual uh, contact tracing as a measure to um, uh, reduce uh, the, the number of infections. So uh, this typically involves four steps. In the first step, there is a, a case reported at the National uh, Public Health Authority through a lab test. Uh, then the epidemiologist would typically, typically take an interview of the infected person trying to identify the uh, contacts uh, over a period of uh, uh, days in the past. Uh, then the, in the third step, the, uh, those contacts would be uh, notified in order to quarantine, isolate according to the uh, public health authority guidelines. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as a last step, there would be the monitoring of, uh, of contacts in order to, uh, see, uh, to, to monitor the situation. Uh, now, this uh, has uh, proven quite effective. Uh, but also, on the other hand, uh, impose some, uh, let's say, uh, um, heavy requirements in terms of human resources uh, at the national health system. So, for example, uh, in late May 2020, the NHS in the UK reported that uh, they had uh, around 25,000 contact tracing uh, staff. Uh, uh, that had the capacity to trace uh, around 10,000 contacts per day. Now, even though this has been quite effective, uh, there are some disadvantages in this process. So, for example, the, uh, the interview uh, step in this process introduces some delays in notifying the contacts. Uh, and also, there might be some contacts that could be missed. For example, um, uh, when you have uh, a, a, an infected person that cannot remember his or her contact, or especially when you have, uh, let's say, contacts with people that you don't know, some random encounters or nearby passengers in the, in the bus or taxi or in the restaurant, um, um, cinema or theater. And this is where uh, the digital contact tracing uh, came up uh, as a, a, let's say, an ICT uh, solution uh, to, to, to this problem. Now, with traditional, with the manual contact tracing, uh, the thing is that um, um, we are epidemiologists are always one, one step behind, which means that uh, a, one, uh, a person is an individual is asked to, to self-isolate only when they know that they are infected. But by that time, um, for example, until they, um, um, they have some symptoms, they probably have infected other uh, close contacts. Now with the uh, digital contact tracing, uh, uh, epidemiologists can be one step ahead, meaning that uh, uh, when there is a, a close, uh, when there is a, a person infected, not only him, but also the close contacts that have been identified by this uh, application would self-isolate, thus breaking uh, quite a, a, a few of the possible uh, infection chains, as the epidemiologists call them. 
A, a quick remark here that will also come, uh, 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 come up again later is that co digital contact tracing uh, is more of a complement uh, rather than a substitute for the manual contact tracing. Um, there have been different approaches uh, to, uh, for uh, implementing digital contact tracing. So uh, let's say the first generation, if you like, of these systems uh, was based on the use of uh, uh, data, location-based data uh, uh, provided by the mobile operator, usually without uh, the user's consent. So um, you understand that this is uh, kind of a, um, a, let's say, invasive uh, approach to digital contact tracing. Then the, the second generation of this application um, relied on uh, the user's consent, sharing uh, their uh, GPS uh, locations uh, in order for the epidemiologist to be able to identify uh, close contacts, both in space uh, and time. So this is, again, uh, let's say this is voluntarily, but uh, on the other hand, it still uh, involves the um, uh, re revealing some uh, sensitive personal data like location information, which is not really required for the purpose of, um, of contact tracing for a pandemic. And uh, finally, uh, the, let's say the, uh, uh, the third generation of this uh, uh, digital contact tracing relies on Bluetooth uh, technology as a means for, let's say, what they call proximity uh, tracing. So this uh, offers uh, anonymous and privacy preserving uh, contact tracing. Uh, it relies more on the exchange of Bluetooth messages rather than location data. Uh, and there are two ways uh, to, to do this uh, without getting into my, many technical details. So in the centralized approach, uh, there is a central entity, for example, in the public health authority that would, let's say, receive uh, all the data uh, by, by the user and then uh, centrally try to identify the, candidate, the possible contacts of that infected user in order to trigger and push the notifications to uh, those, uh, those uh, contacts. Uh, whereas on the decentralized uh, approach, which uh, further promotes uh, privacy preservation, uh, it is the user device that, uh, let's say, uh, does the risk computation and, uh, and notifies, let's say, uh, the, uh, the, the user. Now, uh, with Bluetooth technology, um, um, very soon some technical issues came up, which had to do with the secure scanning and data transmission uh, between folks. And uh, importantly, it was the cross-device uh, interoperability uh, not only between, let's say, uh, Android phones, but also between um, uh, Google and Apple uh, phones. So uh, in that uh, context, uh, in around April uh, 2020, uh, two tech giants um, uh, joined forces uh, for the first time in their history in order to develop a contact tracing technology uh, for, uh, uh, the, uh, for public health. Uh, and as you can see in the, in the press release they are uh, highlighted, the intention uh, and the priorities was to offer, uh, uh, let's say, a, a solution, technology solution that will respect uh, privacy, transparency, and consent would be of uh, utmost importance. So what they came up with uh, is what is known as the Google Apple Exposure Notification uh, uh, Application Protocol Interface. So in short, this is the GAEN uh, API. Uh, and the way it works, if you can see on your left, uh, I will walk you through the different steps. So uh, you have two individuals, A and B, that they meet. Uh, their phones will exchange uh, some uh, random key codes through uh, Bluetooth. Uh, then in case uh, A becomes uh, infected, he will update his status in his mobile application and will give his, his consent uh, for the uh, keys that his device has generated. Now they have become infected keys. Uh, with his consent, they will be uploaded to uh, a central database. Uh, and then uh, uh, B, uh, uh, whose phone is uh, regularly uh, connecting to this uh, database, uh, downloading uh, the infected keys by uh, other uh, citizens, uh, will receive those um, uh, infected keys anonymously, 
uh, and will uh, and the device will trigger uh, a notification uh, after calculating this uh, exposure uh, risk uh, on the phone. Okay, so no no further data is exchanged. Now, um, some of the design principles of this solution uh, is that uh, people who test positive are not identified to other users. Um, the, uh, this, uh, this application can only be used for this exposure notification by public health authorities during the pandemic management. Uh, the solution will work uh, seamlessly across Android and iPhones. Uh, it's not allowed to uh, combine it with other, let's say, location services, for example, using GPS, cellular, or Wi-Fi data in order to gain more fine-grained information about the, uh, the, let's say, the infected user or the other contacts, let's say, uh, whereabouts. Uh, there will be only a single application uh, that uh, is allowed on the app stores for each region, uh, country, or state that has uh, receive the, approv uh, the approval by the local public health authority. Uh, it, it will rely, of course, on this decentralized exposure risk calculation. So as I uh, explained before, uh, in steps five and six, this risk calculation in order to, uh, to, 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 risk, to, to get a notification within the app uh, in case uh, a person has been in close contact with an infected user takes place only on the mobile uh, device of the user. Um, uh, there is a secure exchange of Bluetooth uh, messages with the nearby devices. And as a future step, as in, this is still pending, um, uh, they promised also to replace this API by integrating the whole functionality uh, within the uh, uh, Android and iOS operating system. Now, a few uh, let's say figures and, and facts about the, uh, the uptake. Uh, an effectiveness of uh, this kind of a uh, GAEM based uh, uh, contact tracing app. So by the end of August, uh, there were 70 territories around the world that had deployed these kind of applications. Uh, this includes 26 states uh, in the USA and also uh, 44 other countries around the world, including 20 EU member states. Um, for instance, um, some time ago, uh, when I was checking at the, uh, let's say, the statistics, uh, the NHS COVID-19 app um, uh, was used by more than 19 million users, which is more than 40% of the adult population in the UK. And regarding the whole EU, according to some statistics shared uh, within the eHealth network, uh, 27, around 27% of the population have downloaded the national um, exposure notification applications. Now, um, uh, with regards to their effectiveness, because uh, people and actually also the, the public health authorities and the epidemiologists have been, um, let's say, questioning uh, the effectiveness, there have been some recent uh, studies that actually um, um, uh, support, let's say, the, uh, the use uh, and encourage the use of digital contact tracing um, uh, together, of course, with manual contact tracing. So for example, uh, the, this kind of applications could reduce the infection rate by 12%, um, uh, according to a, a study at the University of, from the University of Arizona. Uh, with even 15% of uptake, um, there could be a drop in the infections by 15%, and to, uh, to the number of deaths by 11%, uh, percent, uh, when, of course, as I said before, combined with manual contact tracing, according to some modeling done by Google and, and Oxford University in Washington. Uh, and more recently, um, uh, in a publication uh, about the NHS COVID-19 app, they reported that for every 1% increase in, uh, let's say, the, uh, the, the, the app uh, user base, uh, the number of infections can be infected by close to 1% based on modeling or to 2.3% two, uh, 2 based on statistical uh, analysis. So uh, now what we did in, in, in Cyprus, I mean, in, in that uh, uh, context. So uh, as I said, in, in um, early summer 2020, uh, we uh, started this uh, project uh, together with uh, the Science Center of Excellence the Deputy Ministry of Research, Innovation, and uh, Digital Policy, the Ministry of Health, and the National eHealth Authority. 
uh, in order to develop and release the national contact uh, uh, tracing app. Uh, so even though uh, we uh, heavily relied on open source uh, solutions, um, uh, still uh, this involved uh, a considerable effort in uh, the development, integration, and of course the, the, the release of the system. So um, I don't know if you can see my, my pointer, let me try to, to do this. So the main uh, components uh, in this, uh, uh, um, let's say, architecture are of course the, um, uh, the mobile application, the Conftrace RN application, which is based on uh, an open source project uh, the path from the Path Check Foundation, which is a spin-off of the MIT. Then there's the uh, backend server and database uh, based on an open source project uh, uh, provided by them and, and maintained by the Corona Warn App, that's the German uh, contact tracing application. Uh, then there is this middleware that we had to develop from scratch in order for these two uh, solutions, uh, I mean the backend and the mobile application, to be able to, to talk uh, to each other because there were, uh, there were different implementations, so this was about a message transformation. Uh, then there is the uh, verification server that handles all the functionality for generating the one-time passwords uh, for, the, for the system. Uh, and then we have the Snow uh, platform that manages the COVID-19 uh, uh, cases, uh, handles essentially the contact tracing um, a, a procedure. And finally, there is a European Federation gateway service, uh, which is the entity in the uh, European, uh, implemented by the European Commission in order to um, um, uh, enable this cross-border uh, interoperability of the mobile applications uh, deployed uh, across different member states. So this will allow uh, uh, two applications from different member states to be able to talk uh, to each other. So um, uh, then, uh, so let me quickly go through the steps. So step one, uh, there is a one-time password that is being sent to, 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 to the user. There is a request to generate a one-time password. This one-time password is created and is being sent uh, uh, to the um, uh, mobile application uh, through an SMS. Uh, then the uh, keys of the user, uh, of the infected user uh, with his or her consent are submitted uh, to the middleware. Uh, where the OTP will be uh, checked uh, to see whether this is valid and has not expired or not used before. If this is verified, then the, uh, the keys will be stored uh, into the, uh, the, the bucket. Uh, um, then uh, with regards to the distribution of keys, uh, the middleware is always preparing the, the keys uh, uploaded by uh, other infected users in Cyprus. And then these are distributed twice a day autom automatically or uh, with you know, like manual triggering within the application to all uh, the users. With regards to the uh, connectivity with the European Federation Gateway Service, uh, periodically, the, let's say the, the keys, the infected keys from Cypriot citizens are uploaded. And in the same way, all the keys uh, uploaded by citizens in other EU member states through their corresponding applications are downloaded. Now, um, okay, some quick uh, st st statistics. So uh, here you can see the, the daily downloads uh, from uh, uh, our backend, uh, downloaded keys from the European Federation Gateway Service, EFGS, in short. So here around April or May this year, you can see uh, the increase in the number of keys due to, let's say, third wave in many EU countries, but also due to many countries or onboarding the, the EFGS. Um, then there was a drop uh, around June uh, where we saw the vaccine, uh, vaccination uptake. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we can either see now here the, this picture uh, that is in line with the current situation now in, in September, where the uh, keys are start rising again. Uh, with regards to the up, uh, to the uploads, uh, so the numbers, so the keys generated by uh, the um, Cypriot citizens, uh, these are not many. Uh, so maximum we had around 24,000 users in the peak period. Now they are around for 1,500. 
Uh, so there was a, a small number of infections reported and around uh, 400 keys that were uploaded. So essentially this was not a game changer uh, in Cyprus, but uh, at least there is uh, a, a, a health infrastructure that is also integrated with the uh, contact tracing ecosystem that is there in place operational for future uh, needs. Now, um, moving to some uh, security uh, considerations. So there is security in, uh, that is uh, considered in different layers. So there is some inherent security due to the use of the GAN uh, API. Uh, like I said before, one uh, country or state can use uh, the um, uh, one country. Um, so uh, one application can be used by each country approved by the local public authority. Uh, the national infected keys are always validated by Google and, and Apple before uh, being able to store them. Uh, the Bluetooth payload is, is encrypted. But on the other hand, there are also some known cybersecurity uh, uh, issues. So, uh, for example, the possibility of replay attacks uh, that have been documented in the literature. Um, in, in general, this generalized approach uh, offers uh, better protection against uh, eavesdropping attack. But nevertheless, there is still a big attack surface. So for example, replay, enumeration, relay, retroactive, or location tracing, or even fake exposure attacks are possible. But at least the good news is that these, are, uh, these kind of attacks are mostly feasible uh, for tech savvy uh, attackers. Now on the different level uh, with respect to the one-time password, uh, this is only sent to uh, the infected user with SMS. Uh, it, is, uh, it is 12 digit long and it has an expiry time of 24 hours, so it can only be used at one. So uh, usually uh, submitting this OTP, uh, um, uh, in, uh, providing as input this OTP in the application to upload the keys soon after the SMS would prevent uh, brute force uh, uh, attacks by malicious users trying to upload, uh, let's say, fake keys. Uh, and, and finally, with regards to the communication with the, uh, with the European Federation Gateway Service, uh, here there is uh, um, a secure communication um, between the EFGS and the national backend. So, for example, the, the Cov Tracer backend in this case, uh, which is based on mutual transport layer security authentication. So, the two entities will exchange, uh, let's say, the certificates and validate them before any communication starts. And then, of course, the, each member state will have a, a private and a public key, uh, uh, key that is being used to provide data integrity by signing, let's say, the batches of, of keys uh, before uh, uploading. And, and, and finally, um, uh, some uh, before I finish my, my presentation, uh, some privacy, uh, let's say, considerations, some privacy uh, issues, because this is also important, not only security. Um, so this, uh, the Cove Tracer uh, EN application doesn't reveal any personal information. It's only about uh, uh, sharing the test and symptoms onset date uh, in order to be able to generate the one-time password. Uh, importantly, the Ministry of Health doesn't know uh, if the infected user has really used the OTP to upload any keys or not. Um, again, it is important to note that the notify a user who receives a notification about a possible contact with an infected user doesn't know who, with who, where, uh, or when the possible attack, uh, the, the possible contact took place. Uh, and also the status of the user, whether he or she is healthy or infected is not uh, shared. Um, there is also a two-phase uh, user consent that is required before uploading the keys. So there is a consent requested for first receiving the OTP by SMS, and then before uploading the keys uh, from within the, uh, the, the application to, to the backend. And of course, there is a long, also a long list of uh, other data privacy arrangements that have to be uh, handled appropriately and receive approval by the Commissioner for Personal Data Protection in Cyprus. Yes, and with this, I finish my presentation. Hopefully, I'm still on time. Uh, and I open the floor for some questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much for this interesting presentation and for showing us those uh, tools and uh, the experience of your research center. Uh, yes, I forgot to mention this before. Uh, if you have any question while our speakers are presenting, you can always uh, write them in the chat. 
uh, or take this time to ask uh, questions to um, each of the speakers or also at the end of the session, we will have a question time. So if you have any question, please take the floor. All right, maybe our um, some questions will come at the very end of our presentations. So um, thank you again to Professor Laudias for this interesting speech. And I would now give the floor to our second speaker, which is uh, Professor Franco Tomasi from the University of Salento. And here he will be sharing a note about the ransom attack against the COVID-19 vaccination booking system of the Lazio region in Italy. So Professor Tomasi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Just a second. There it is. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good? Okay. Clearly. Okay. As uh, our presenter uh, already said, I wish to share a note about this uh, very serious random ransomware uh, attack, uh, which was. Uh, uh, launched against the COVID-19 uh, vaccination booking system of the region, Regione Lazio, region Lazio in Italy. And um, uh, some information and maybe some reflection on, on the attack. And uh, before beginning, I uh, wish to say that, of course, uh, it's not easy to find information about this kind of attacks because usually the victims the victims uh, tend to uh, hide the information uh, for very security reason. Uh, therefore, uh, you have to to find this information in, in many different ways. Of course, from official statements and from the news and maybe also rumors, there is no way to get the hand on the exact technical details of the attack. Nobody's going to tell you exactly how things went. Uh, there is no insider technical report. And uh, I use I will use these labels OS, PMN, and RM to uh, say which is the source of each piece of information. Well, and one thing I want to add is uh, this is not about throwing the blame on anybody. Of course, it's very easy after an attack has happened. And, and after the results are known uh, to point the finger against uh, this and this part of the organization, it's a very easy sport to play. Uh, it's not my, my purpose. I just want to reflect on the incident and try to learn something and try to uh, see what can be learned from the incident. And also it's not a good idea to boast your security provisions or skills. This is the best way to attract, attract uh, attackers on your facilities, just to, to prove they are better than you. So it's not a good idea to, to teach lessons. And uh, of course, as everybody knows in this field, there is no absolute security around. You are always uh, uh, open to attacks and possibly uh, you can be the next victim. There is uh, the only thing you can try to do is to adopt best practices to be informed and to uh, learn from what is known. And um, well, this is uh, uh, the preliminary part. These are the facts. What happened? 
maybe not not all of you know about this incident uh, there was some talk about uh, data stolen to an important uh, Italian public agency that was in the in the night uh, of uh, the July 30 this year and uh, in the night uh, between 31 uh, 30th of July and August 1st uh, all the terminals of the regional Lazio public earth system uh, were shown the following screen your files are encrypted. Uh, don't try to modify. You, you can read by yourself. Anyway, there was a link to follow, which was uh, a Tor, the Onion uh, router. Uh, therefore, something some people call the dark web. Uh, you had to follow this link and get instructions about what to do uh, which was of course paying a ransom to get back your encrypted files uh, on august 1st the official statement came from regione lazio an anchor attack to our data center is in progress uh, vaccination bookings may uh, suffer delays uh, it, it was uh, uh, at a given point was told uh, officially, but uh, uh, not very clear. It must be said, which the culprit was the uh, an employee of the contractor of Regione Lazio, this uh, company called Lazio Crea, and uh, it was we were told that through his computer. Um, the uh, rogues were uh, able to access the uh, data center of the uh, health system of Regione Lazio. Um, well, it looks the attack was carried on by, uh, as they call it, ransomware as a service um, uh, software. That is uh, uh, the uh, the gang of attackers uh, uh, simply paid someone who developed uh, the uh, software and uh, therefore uh, this is a, a very easy way for the developers to uh, not be involved into the criminal uh, activity uh, they simply write the software and they sell it of course they can be prosecuted as well but uh, the main uh, responsibility uh, stand on the shoulder uh, stands on the shoulders of the gang who paid to use the the software the uh, software uh, there is no uh, certainty about which the ransomware was uh, most uh, observers uh, thinks it was this ransom uh, exx um, uh, ransomware, uh, which is uh, operated by a crew named uh, Spite, Sprite Spider, but there were some analysts saying it was Lockbit 2. Uh, it is thought they may have been used together. The uh, attack point of the uh, Ransomware uh, was, in fact, a, a Windows security hole, a bug of the Windows Active Directory. And uh, of course, uh, some kind of double extortion in, has been attempted, at least the news uh, uh, said so, that is, uh, it was asked for a ransom, a ransom for decrypting the data um, and then a ransom to avoid the uh, uh, this data being sold on uh, the dark web. Um, 
it looks no ransom has been paid, at least this is an, an official statement. It looks the data, uh, the encrypted data were in fact uh, protected by a, 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 an offline backup, therefore they were recovered. At least this is the official statement. Uh, they were recovered through um, a system called virtual tape library. And uh, there were a few days, uh, uh, about a week of uh, service downtime. And uh, since the, data, the, the backup was uh, uh, taken uh, uh, two days before the attack, uh, therefore it looks two, data, uh, two days of uh, worth of data were lost. And uh, it's very likely that, in fact, data have been extracted and uh, sooner or later they will be sold in the dark, in the dark web. Just to give some per perspective on uh, ransomware and uh, attacks, this is a, a plot of uh, the number of the attacks, I, I hope it is readable, number of attacks for each kind of uh, uh, ransomware. You see how many uh, different ransomware are available. The one which are suspected to be, to have been used in this incident are, as I said, Lockbit and RansomX. For example, Lockbit, uh, is uh, thought to be uh, to have been used in 58, 58 uh, attacks. Um, but you see how many there are. For example, uh, this dark side uh, was used in 99, uh, 99 uh, uh, attacks. Uh, why I'm uh, isolating this dark side? Because I wish to give you some uh, idea about the ransomware economy. There was a, a, a study uh, done about this very uh, ransomware dark side, and um, it was found that uh, 99 organizations were infected by this dark side ransomware, and, uh, and that 90 millions of dollars were paid in Bitcoin as a ransom. Since uh, uh, those researchers uh, found the payments came from uh, 47 different Bitcoin wallets, uh, well, it can be said almost 47% of the victim in fact paid a ransom and uh, the average payment was of course around uh, 1.9 millions of dollars, which gives an idea. This is a single ransomware. You saw how many how many uh, ransomware are available. Therefore, uh, it's quite quite an economy. Um, the ransom EXX uh, ransomware, which uh, was thought thought responsible of the Regione Lazio attack. Um, encrypts the file with the uh, AES uh, uh, cipher, which uh, of course is a very strong one. It's, uh, and the, the key for the encryption was a 256-bit uh, key, which is thought to be uh, really strong and secure. And uh, the uh, each file was uh, encrypted with a different uh, AES uh, key. And uh, in turn, the key was encrypted with the uh, 4096-bit RSA public key. And then the result of this encryption was appended to uh, the file uh, whose, uh, uh, which was encrypted with that uh, symmetric key well, the encryption, the public uh, uh, key encryption of the symmetric key was attached, was uh, appended to the file. Uh, of course, any recovery method in the operating system was also disabled. 
and the original files were overwritten with the encrypted versions so that no no attempt to recover them through the usual uh, methods uh, is uh, uh, feasible uh just a few final remarks about the entire uh, incident it has been said well if it was the culprit was this employee and it was said uh, that the, the son of this employee were playing with this computer and doing str uh, strange things in fact it looks it was a, a phishing uh, attack uh, the, some link hidden in a, in an email uh, which was uh, uh, which was uh, clicked on and uh, but you cannot blame an home access for the lack of security of the entire system if 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 your system can be uh, defeated by uh, an attack to an home computer then then there is some problem with your security system this is of course uh, uh, so the, this poor man is is not uh, really uh, liable for the entire accident it it is uh, uh, who designed the entire system which is in question um, well it looks uh, after defeating the personal computer which was without of course uh, uh, antivirus software and so on that computer was used to access the visual private network of the uh, data center which is another surprising uh, discover discovery since uh, it's really surprising that uh, such an important visual private network was accessible uh, without uh, some kind of multi-factor uh, authentication, at least uh, two factors uh, authentication. And this is something which uh, jumped to the eyes. Uh, one thing uh, which was uh, often a matter of confusion, uh, people often talk about uh, backups, uh, online backups, and so on. Well, an online backups, backup is not a backup, in fact, because the attacker can attack the backup as well as the original data. And therefore, it's not a real backup. It's what is called a mirror, which is not a backup. A, a, a true backup but must be offline. It, it can be online for a really short interval of time but real backups must be uh, in fact uh, offline and these are in my opinion the main uh, reflections and uh, teachings we can extract from this uh, from this accident uh, well if you have questions um at your, at your uh, I'm here. Thank you, Professor Tomasi. Thank you for all your for, for all the insights you share with us and for these interesting reflections. Uh, I see I raised the hand from uh, Professor Laurias. So please go ahead. Shall you have any question or any comment uh, regarding the presentation of Professor Tomasi? Yes, a quick question. Thank, thank you, Professor Tomasi, for sharing those insights about the ransomware attack. Uh, I was wondering, I mean, uh, this kind of, of attack can be easily, let's say, uh, replicated to, to target uh, the uh, COVID-19 vaccination uh, uh, booking systems in other uh, EU member states. I was wondering if, I mean, let's say the, let's say the lessons learned uh, from this scenario were shared with uh, uh, other public health authorities or the national CERT, uh, let's say, uh, organizations, uh, let's say, in a formal way in order to increase uh, preparedness. Thank you. I'm not aware of any, uh, of any such kind of uh, sharing. Uh, give me in mind, it's um, a bit more of one month uh, ago and uh, well, uh, the I would say they've been uh, heavily hit by this 
accident. And you know, it's not it's not uh, uh, pleasant to to share your <laughs> your weakness. You know, uh, so the uh, contractors, in fact, uh, this matter, the security uh, matters, are in the hands of contractors. And of course, these contractors that do not like to to show themselves, <laughs> of course, prone to this kind of uh, attacks, and uh, they they are not likely to <laughs> to brag around about about security after they've been so heavily hit. Because in fact, as you can see, I'm sorry to see to say that, but the entire matter showed. A, a rather questionable security organization, you know. Uh, as I said, I, I don't want to point a finger against anyone, but, but in, in fact, you cannot say it was a, a well-designed security security system. Uh, therefore, I wouldn't hope much for for much. After all, you have to uh, remember that the the way the attack was carried on was really trivial, because you you it's almost unbelievable you can defeat such a system by any a phishing email. <laughs> it's rather embarrassing, I would say. Therefore, uh, there is not much they can teach. I. This is my impression, anyway. Anyway, I'm not aware of any of any official statement about the technical detail. The technical details. Everybody is trying to hide, of course, <laughs> everything under the carpet. <laughs> this is my impression, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tomati, and thank you for again to Professor Laurias for stimulating uh, again the conversation. Um, it's, uh, it was, I have to say, I live in Rome. I, I was aware of the attack and I live in, in the region. So it was very interesting to get to know a little bit more. I, I did not fully understand everything. I must to confess it was very technical in some parts, but it was very interesting um, as a citizen of the region to, to know a little bit more about the, the, the other aspects related to the attack. Thank so you. Um, we have a third intervention for our um, internal session, uh, which comes from the University of Trasos Montes de Alto Duoro. I hope I pronounce it a little bit better now. It's Professor Maria Filomena Lopez uh, Vega, uh, which will share the, um, a, an experience on pandemic management, a view from a Portuguese academia testing center. So, Professor Filomena, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm just trying to... Okay, can you see uh, the presentation? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, um, I am talking here in the name of the UTAD COVID-19 Testing Center uh, and answering an invitation that was made to Professor uh, Boventura that is here with us. Uh, and we, we thank you very much for this invitation. And it is a pleasure to show you uh, what we have been done since the, the, the pandemic uh, um, uh, came to Portugal or entered in, in Portugal. Uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't want to, to forget to, to say that, uh, to congratulate the organization of the Congress and bring the greetings of the rector of UTAD, Professor Emilio Gomes, uh, to, this, uh, to this event. Okay, so um, as I was, uh, uh, before I was, uh, uh, I was starting, I just want you to say that uh, probably the view that I'm bringing, it's more related with the physical infrastructures and the, the, um, the, the personal that we had to handle and the way that we deal with the pandemic uh, here or the, in Portugal, uh, specifically on the diagnosis uh, stage. Okay, so, okay, so 
very briefly, okay, so it was in March the 2nd that we um, we had the, the news that we had the first cases, uh, case of COVID-19 in Portugal. Uh, uh, a long, a long, now it seems a long time ago, uh, but, uh, but since there, since then, um, the world changed, of course, and we had to. We didn't have the tools, and we had uh, we had to to spe specifically um, uh, find the right tools to identify this virus and to diagnose the people the more quickly uh, before it was possible. Uh, this this was uh, uh, we know we knew. Um, that were uh, different forms to identify the virus, but I think all of you know that uh, the the one that's more accepted, the gold standard for for diagnosis, uh, it's the molecular uh, test RT PCR, and uh, um, is the, this test uh, this test uh, uh, specifically for SARS-CoV-2 did not exist, but uh, the scientific community was incredible in my point of view in rapidly uh, organizing itself and uh, and find and design and sequence this virus um, almost like the Hollywood speed uh, of in the movies seen in the movies. So quickly we knew how to 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 do this okay so we needed uh, some some tools some equipments uh, some labs some people that understood uh, about uh, about the collection people that understood about the rna extraction okay so the genome of the virus is rna and we had to uh, to design the the what we call the probes and the, the the primers in molecular biology to rapidly design a PCR test that was able to identify or not if the virus was present in in sample. So I think uh, we all now have uh, have been heard about this. Uh, so as I was telling you, so in March, uh, we had the first case of COVID-19, and in the middle of March, we had the Portuguese lockdown here. Um, in that time, okay, so we, we work in a, in a university, a multidisciplinary university, and I work in a, in a group and in a lab dedicated to genetics. Not specifically, we were not working with virus, uh, we were not we were not working in diagnosis. Uh, we were working um, in different fields like chromosome evolution, so fundamental research, and also some applied research, mostly in cancer. Uh, but what we immediately sought is that we had the the equipment. We had the know-how and we had some people uh, that were inside the house, but uh, with, uh, with uh, feeling the need to do something, uh, to share our knowledge and to put our knowledge in the, in the service of the community. So in uh, around April, March to April, uh, we mobilized a group of three, uh, three persons uh, people, sorry, we mobilized and uh, talked with our previous rector and uh, tell, uh, told them, okay, so we, we had all that we need um, to, to start diagnosing uh, here in Utag. Okay, so we had to uh, adapt the labs that we, that we had. The lab was not, was not a clean room, uh, so we had to adapt the lab, the, the different labs, we had to train a little bit all the people that were not used to work in, with this high level of uh, biosafety um, risks. Um, but we uh, we had all the uh, all the support from from UTAD, from our our university, and we uh, contact a group of people. And you will see that in the beginning it were it was a, a little group of people, um, and in May. 2020, we we started to uh, to put this service uh, um, to the community. Okay, it was not only us. Okay, so it uh, um, something very interesting happened here. It was that uh, 21 institutions, academic or research institutions, 
uh, feel the same that we felt. So we can help uh, and uh, we, we, can, we can join efforts. So uh, incredibly, in, in a very, very short period of time, 21 labs were committed to a molecular diagnosis, the, the maximum number of, of samples that we could. And this group was called um, uh, the Testing Heroes. Okay, so in Portuguese, it's Heróis dos Testes. And um, since then, something that, uh, that I, I haven't, uh, I think I haven't never seen this, uh, people around Portugal, and I know this happened also in the world, were, um, were able and were very keen to share their knowledge uh, to share their trips, uh, to, to help each other. And uh, this was completely volunteer. Okay, so I think this was a very, very um, example how, uh, how we can, uh, can deal with these things. And uh, this, this does not, does not, does not uh, was, it was not imposed by no one. So it was uh, a volunteer, a volunteer work. Okay, so um, our, our testing center is composed by some professors and uh, senior researchers, but also by PhD and master students. And fortunately, uh, the government uh, gave us some grants uh, to, fin to finance the people that were in the beginning working on this, uh, having uh, nothing in change. So, we professors and researchers are giving our time. Okay, so we don't receive nothing extra. Um, it's it's our time. But a lot of people that were uh, technicians um, now are receiving some uh, some financial support, and that was very important. The, as you see, we we passed from a group of uh, um, a few person, a few a few group, a, a very very small group. Uh, in in this photo, on, only four of us. But in the beginning, we had like seven uh, seven people with us, and suddenly we are now composed by a very a very nice um, group that helps in the different stages of the process. We don't make the sampling, okay, so the sampling is made by uh, professionals, health professionals, um, and we receive the samples and we process, we, we, we treat informatically the, the data uh, um, that is supposed to be, that is supposed not that, that is uh, complete, that is encoded. We receive the samples uh, in an alphanumerical uh, code. Uh, we, we process the, the, um, the samples and then we give the results. And uh, who, with who are we working? So mostly we make diagnosis at this moment and uh, uh, we were also making screening, okay? The diagnosis is directly made with the health, uh, um, health uh, systems in Portugal and the admi administrations. Uh, and this is uh, when, when, uh, when, when someone is presenting some symptoms, when anyone was in direct contact or whatever with someone. So this is made as a prescription. Uh, but we also made uh, some work with the social security that is a Portuguese uh, and, uh, government entity, uh, assuring um, that the, uh, the, the, the homes that uh, the, the take care of the elder people uh, were secure. And this was the screening uh, that we made, trying to stop uh, outbreaks or try to detect outbreaks and uh, stop the, the transmission uh, chain. We also made some tests to uh, Utah students that were working with elder people or younger people that were to be integrated in the society. Okay, very, very quickly, because I don't know, I'm, I'm sure that these, these are a lot of, of numbers, but just for, for we to we to, un to understand uh, the tests that we were making, so uh, we work for different regions uh, in in Portugal, specifically in the north in the north of Portugal, 
and we work uh, we worked with the three to four uh, different uh, um, what they call as health associations regional associations um, so we started uh, we start we started with a uh, few tests but uh, uh, suddenly we were dealing uh, with a, a lot lot of samples we we had something like 400 um, uh, 400 uh, samples in one day for instance and in the beginning it was uh, it was very intensive uh, for a small group of people um the the cases the positive cases uh, started to 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 grow as you know this is one one region in the other region we can see also the 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 increased incredible increase from uh, may to september to october to february and uh, we were processing uh, a lot of samples in this this is also another another place and uh, um okay i'm going to pass this uh we were we were making a lot of uh, samples to, uh, per day so uh we were um we we had some critical times when we we had a few number of people and we we were working like 12 hours a day uh in, in in shifts so uh people were really exhausted um okay so this is the data from the last months okay um reflecting some of the the the, the waves that we were uh, hearing about okay this is another this is from utad the students that we made and this this program that was i was talking to you about this Testing Heroes program um, prevented nearly 90, uh, 900 COVID-19 outbreaks in elder people homes. So this, this was very important and the, the proof that the uh, people can gather and can join efforts uh, to, uh, to, to make all, all that is needed in a, in a specific time. Um, to increase and the, the 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 reason why we could um, we could answer the demands that we had at the time is that we uh, we put some efforts in uh, in trying to 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 get uh, automatic extraction instead of manual extraction of RNA of the biological material. As you can see here, uh, we passed we passed from uh, from a very um, something like 24 samples in one hour and a half uh, and now we had two uh, two two machines two um, automatic extractors and we can make these like 64 samples by one person in 40 minutes so we upscaled uh, the, the 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 equipment and we upscaled the the answer uh, that we can now provide the same thing for the second part of the the procedures okay the the, uh, the pcr uh, we increased this as we were able to to make to analyze 46 samples in 2 hours and now in the same time we can we analyze the the four times more um, samples so uh, this upscaling really uh, allowed us together with the, the the people that were that is were now working with us, we were able now to 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 get a very a very answer uh, um, answer to to this demand to these demands, and uh, we recently um, got a fine uh, a project um, financed, um, and this will uh, allow us to uh, make a specific lab for not only for COVID-19, we hope so, um, but we want to respond. We, we were very resilient uh, and we, we want to prevent, uh, prevent some more of these, uh, of these outbreaks. And this can, make, uh, this can be made by the, our rapid answer. And to do that, we, have to, to, we, we need the physical infrastructures that allow us to work in security the people that are working there 
in the beginning, I must say, I think we all were very afraid. So we 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 work, as you know, with these uh, these uh, astronaut su suits, um, and in the beginning, we didn't know uh, how how these will gonna work. Uh, in, in speaking about my personal experience, I have two, two, two kids. And I went, when I was in the lab, I was there for all the day. And when I got home, I took all my clothes, even, even if I was dressing my clothes with this, uh, this, this protection uh, equipment, I, in, in my garage, I took all my clothes and I, I got in, into, into a, a, the first bathroom I, I, I get. And I was trying to get rid of anything that could be bring, brought uh, to, to my home uh, with me. So now we, we, are, uh, we, are, we are working in these clean rooms. So we are preparing these clean rooms that will allow us uh, in the future uh, to be ready or at least a little bit more ready than we were in the in March uh, 2020 this uh, this lab will be called genetics for you and uh, and uh, hopefully will as i told you will will be able to not only to to answer this this uh, covid-19 demand but also a, a lot um, a lot different, different, uh, different uh, things in different uh, um, attacks. In this case, biological attacks or biological threats uh, that we might have uh, in the future. Um, thank you so much for for uh, allowing me to present uh, the work uh, we have been done, and uh, we are completely, um, completely able and with the uh, strong will to. Uh, collaborate uh, and to enter in this uh, this fantastic network. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to you, Professor, for sharing this uh, success uh, story. It's very. It was very uh, not only interesting but very touching and, and nice to see that there are success stories and uh, touching our lives during this pandemic. So it's not only work, it's a mix of a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, since the pandemic uh, was uh, a true story for all of us, um, not, yes. notwithstanding the, the role, the job or, or the background, it was, it was, uh, it, it's a common story. And so we hope this occasion was a good occasion for you to share your success, but also for us to, for hearing and learning. So I want to thank you and your university for being with us today and sharing this, uh, this interest, very interesting experience. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we are a little late on our, uh, on our um, schedule, or at least uh, we uh, um, agree. I think we might be uh, jumping the break and um, um, giving the floor. Uh, for the next uh, speaker, which was indeed uh, scheduled for uh, 16 and 20. So we are perfectly on time for the next speaker, but a little late to enjoy a coffee break. You are allowed to drink your coffee while we're here and listening, of course. Uh, and uh, again, um, I want to thank you all for being here today. And uh, do not hesitate, shall you have any additional questions or or comments to share, to write them on the chat, or to uh, join our question time at the very end of the webinar. So now it's a time for an institutional presentation, which will be uh, delivered by Professor Pierluigi Lopaco, which is the assessor for the health services at the, um, the, the Puglia region in Italy. So he will be sharing the experience of the resilience management at the Puglia Regional Healthcare infrastructure. So Professor Lopalco, the floor is all yours and thanks for being here with us today. Good afternoon. I, I will start to share my screen. Here we are. I hope that uh, you can... Uh, we can see it very clearly. You can see. It. Perfect. So I, I will uh, tell you um, I will make a long story short, because you know, uh, managing uh, the whole uh, pandemic waves during this time 
uh, was a long story, but I, I, I will focus my attention just on a few points that uh, I think can be some learning points, uh, um, at least from my point of view, that is a point of view of a guy that uh, was working in the academy. Uh, I'm a professor of hygiene before doing this job. And then uh, in March, 2020, was uh, called upon this duty uh, by the Puglia region to manage the uh, pandemic. And therefore I was appointed as a local assessor for uh, the healthcare system. So, uh, sorry. So just few, few numbers. The Puglia region is, um, is a region of uh, 4 million inhabitants. And these are the numbers of the pandemic so far. Uh, just to, 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 to give uh, um, an idea of what we are uh, talking about when we talk about resilience. So you imagine uh, a region in South Italy that is hit by a wave with uh, almost 3,000 cases of this uh, terrible infectious disease, uh, almost 7,000 deaths caused by this virus. But the number that I, th I think uh, must be uh, highlighted in, um, in this slide is uh, the central one, 3 uh, million, uh, 3.5, almost 3.5 million tests. It means that uh, we set up a system in the region to uh, collect uh, 3.5 million tests in, a, in about uh, one and a half uh, year that I, I can tell you uh, it's really, really a big effort. We are talking about uh, the fact that we started our testing system with just one lab in the whole region, one lab in the whole region that was able to test uh, this kind of virus. And uh, in few weeks, uh, we uh, had to set up a system uh, with more than 10 labs uh, uh, in the region. In few months, 10 labs became 20. And uh, with the new machinery, with the new, uh, for chemicals uh, and uh, and uh, last but not least, when we are talking about 3.5 million tests, we are talking about 3.5 million times one hand put a swab in the nose of a guy. I, I mean, uh, it, it is 3.5 million acts by uh, healthcare workers that must be also expert healthcare workers. So the effort to set up a system for 3.5 million tests, I can tell you, uh, we can we can name it uh, resilience. And uh, resilience in the system is not just testing; is not just uh, trying to. Um, set up a wall against this pandemic wave, but is, it is also very importantly to set up the system, the hospital system to receive the wave. Because uh, it, it is not a case that we are, we, when, when we talk about pandemics, we talk about waves because, because it, it is really like a tsunami, you know, a tsunami wave. It is not just an epidemic. It is not just, uh, just a factor related to a virus that uh, can cause a fever or other diseases. It is about a wave of patients that uh, really crash uh, against the hospital healthcare services. So uh, here, it, this is a very plastic uh, way to describe these waves. Uh, the, the pink waves uh, are the uh, number of inpatients in uh, the total inpatients in our hospitals. So you can see that uh, during, uh, during the first wave that, uh, that was uh, the spring uh, 2020, our region was uh, uh, hit uh, um, not that hard. 
uh, because uh, you, you can remember that at that time the, 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 there was a very, very hard uh, uh, lockdown in Italy. So the lockdown prevented uh, this wave to be uh, harder. But nevertheless, uh, if, you, if you see uh, the numbers, if you see the numbers, you, you, you can see 800 people in the hospitals. And uh, uh, most importantly, the ICU inpatients, the intensive care units in, uh, in patients that reached a peak of almost 200. And then there was the summer without any sign of virus circulation. But uh, fortunately, uh, we, we had our models and we had our intelligence system that uh, for, had foreseen uh, the incoming wave that without a so hard lockdown would have been much, much harder. And actually, in autumn and therefore uh, during the winter, the, the second way was uh, much harder and much longer. And, uh, and you can see the same on the ICU units. And uh, here in March, there was a, uh, there was a news. Uh, the news uh, was called the so-called uh, so English variant. Uh, the English variant, uh, that was a, a virus variant that, that was uh, much, much more uh, um, spreadly and uh, it, it made uh, um, a so-called third wave that uh, in fact was just a, a continuation of the second wave. But you, you, you can see that the peak of inpatients was uh, more than 2,000 in, uh, in our hospital system. And uh, this is the resilience. This is actually the resilience, the, uh, what we call the response, the hospital response. So the uh, dark uh, bars are the patients. The light bars are the beds. You can see that uh, when uh, we uh, started uh, with the first cases in our region, there were, there were available in ICU unit only 50. 50, five zero, five zero beds for uh, dedicated to, to the disease and available for the disease. And uh, very, very, in a very short time, 50 became uh, to 200 and therefore 300. And you can see that the transformation, the transformation of, of, of this uh, uh, emergency response was uh, very, uh, very quick and very progressive. Um, and fortunately, we were able in uh, less than two months make available two, uh, 180 uh, ICU beds uh, that were enough to contain the first, the first wave. So just to be um, practical, I would uh, like to invite you to make um, an effort for a mind exercise um, uh, to imagine what does it mean to uh, set up 200 ICU beds. So 200 ICU beds, it means that you need 200, not beds, but 200 ventilators. And in that, in that time, I, I, I can remember it was very, very hard to find ventilators in the market. You need, for, it, for each bed, uh, a couple of nurses, specialized nurses, and uh, uh, also specialized doctors. Um, so I can tell you it is a very, very, very hard, a very, very hard, uh, very hard time to set up in so short time uh, to re restore and to recover uh, to make available so many beds. Then you, you can see that after the first wave, uh, those beds were, let's say, um, uh, set back to uh, the normal activity, the normal um, inpatient activity, hospital activity. And then after the summer, again, again, in this case, we were ready. We were ready, so we activated uh, with this strategy that this, I can see it is, uh, this one in, from uh, beginning of October and forth, this is the real uh, resilience um, strategy. 
we set up the ICU beds uh, at the same time um, when the new cases were incoming. In, in this, uh, this way, we were able to preserve the normal hospital activity uh, as long as we could. Uh, be, because the main, uh, the main problem with uh, such uh, event is that uh, um, before, because of the event, because of the pandemic, you have to stop the rest of hospital activity. And therefore, you, you, you can see that the rest of the story is, is uh, quite, um, let's say, quiet, uh, because there, there was uh, no, uh, no emergency in finding ICU beds. And this was, uh, was done, these are the numbers, uh, in a few months, uh, starting from 276 beds in ICU, the total, this is the total, not, not just those ones uh, dedicated uh, to, the, um, to the pandemic, we doubled, doubled the number of ICU beds in a few months. And uh, th this was a really, really uh, resilience uh, exercise. And this was the, um, the, the main way we managed to be more relaxed during the very last wave, the one that I told you was caused by the so-called English variant. Um, this is a maxi emergency um, hospital that was really built just for the pandemic. Um, this was a very, very big effort, and this was done in really built, really built in few weeks. Well, this is the plant, and you can see that each of these red bar is one room with 18, originally 18 beds. And uh, so we, we, we built a, a 10 room emergency hospital with 18 beds. So uh, with a total of theoretical 180 ICU beds. And uh, at the end of the project, uh, there, the, the, there was available some 156 uh, beds that were mixed ICU and um, also available for a, a less intensive care, so a, a middle intensive intensive care. But ne nevertheless, this was really, really a huge project that uh, we were able to make only because we were in an emergency. So we made in few weeks what in a normal, uh, let's say, in normal time, in peace time you need, uh, I think, at least at least uh, one or more year, year, because we could make it uh, because of the fact that we, we couldn't ask for uh, uh, very difficult permissions uh, we, with uh, very, very little bureaucracy, thanks to the fact that we were in a, an emergency. But thanks to this uh, um, hospital, we were able to manage the very last uh, part of the of the emergency. Uh, why? Because th this is uh, like this is one of those modules. Uh, no, eighteen beds, uh, all of all, all of which uh, is in, it's equipped uh, with uh, a ventilator, so they are ICU beds, and uh, um, this disposition uh, can make uh, can. Uh, it is very useful because we can manage more patients with less specialized personnel. So the lack, lack of specialized personnel was the main obstacle to set up more ICU beds. And with this, with this setting, we could use less personnel uh, um, making uh, so assistance to, to more inpatients. Of course, uh, the religion, uh, resilience, it, 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 it is not just to bureaucracy and, uh, and to practical issues, but there is also something that I, I, I could experience on my skin, that is the political aspects of resilience, because 
about that uh, hospital, uh, the local uh, politics was uh, heavily attacked uh, because, you know, you are building uh, an hospital when there is no need for it. So just uh, preventing no, a future wave. It, it is like uh, buying a, a fire extinguisher that uh, you buy it, but you don't know if you can use it or not. But in this case, it was a, a fire extinguisher that was uh, costing 17.7 uh, million euros. So you, you can see that there was a lot of political attention on this. So th this is uh, one of the um, comments from the press that I can translate for you. Uh, this hospital, it, it is ready, but it is closed. It is closed because in Bari, it's the capital, uh, uh, we lack the personnel for this hospital. So we spent 17.7 .7 million euros. You see, this is a, a quite uh, um, nice, quite nice article, quite nice title, but they are pointing that this hospital, it is not ready because of lack of personnel, and uh, we spent a lot of money. Of course, this is February, be before the big, the huge wave that happened uh, during the, um, the last phase of winter and spring, but there were also more uh, less uh, nice uh, comments uh, like this one, uh, Barry, and the new hospital, COVID, the new COVID hospital, it is costly, useless, it is a waste of money. So resilience means also to uh, foresee this kind of attacks and resist to this kind of attacks. And uh, this, this was uh, the time when we uh, built this uh, this hospital. So you, you you see that we could not we could not um, uh, foresee the big the, the next big big wave. So building here building here uh, the huge hospital was really uh, like uh, buying this fire extinguisher of more than seventeen million euros. But uh, fortunately this uh, prevented uh, to be out uh, to be out of beds uh, during the next uh, the next uh, wave and um, ju just a few uh, few words about uh, the second part of a response to the pandemic that was uh, the vaccination the vaccination program uh, again uh, the numbers are impressive uh, so far we administered 5.6 uh, million doses of vaccine. And again, you, you, you may please make an exercise uh, to imagine uh, what is to inject one shot and multiply by uh, 5.6 million times. Uh, so there are 5.6 million hands that are making uh, that action. Fortunately, um, the, the, this means that we reshaped, uh, completely reshaped the system for administering the, the vaccines that before then was just administering the, the vaccine to children or to elderly people in, uh, in winter uh, against influenza. And uh, so set up a completely different system for mass vaccination, 5.6 million doses. And again, we were able also in a very short time to set up and to build this kind of uh, vaccine hubs uh, where you can invite uh, and vaccinate 30, 40 people at one time. Again, you must uh, build these things. You must find and pay nurses, doctors, administrative personnel to register the vaccination. So, uh, it's it's really a, a, a huge exercise, and this was I I I believe the best example of response, the best example of system re re resilience, because uh, yes, there were some problems. <laughs> there were some problems because the demand for vaccine was huge. There was a, a very 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 strong. Uh, public pressure to be vaccinated. So the, these were the images that you, you could find on the press. Again, uh, 
some sort of political resilience. These are uh, attacks from the press that we were not ready, we were not uh, prepared, and therefore people were in line, uh, huge lines uh, for uh, waiting for vaccination. But nevertheless, uh, during an emergency, we, were, we managed to uh, administer 5.6 million doses in a few months. And this is uh, the final result. Thanks to the uh, vaccination, and now in, um, uh, during the summer, uh, we uh, experienced again the, um, the appearance of a, a very nasty variant that was the so-called Delta variant or Indian variant that was much, much, much worse than the Alpha variant. And uh, nevertheless, uh, this is the impact. Uh, this is the very last wave, the, the one that we had uh, during the uh, during the summer, when at the maximum, at the maximum, 24 beds in the ICU units were occupied. So uh, again, I would like to uh, just to to to, to, to finish this uh, this story with some sort of hope, uh, giving hope to the vaccination uh, program that probably will uh, um, give us uh, back our freedom and be back to the time before before the uh, pandemic. So uh, just uh, two lessons learned. I, I, I think that resilience is not an art. Uh, resilience is something that uh, you, you must build up. Resilience is something that you must, uh, you must work for it. And uh, uh, for a complex system like uh, a, a public health care system to be resilient, it is important to have a set of rules. So it is important for any preparedness plan to have a very clear set of rules uh, that make easy uh, whatever you do um, during, uh, during uh, the uh, emergency. You need some redundancy. The redundancy is, is very important. And the fact that every, every uh, healthcare system now, it, it is not redundant because it must be efficient must be 95% efficient, it's a problem. It's a problem because efficiency means that you, you just have the doctors uh, just enough for uh, you need uh, usually, but uh, those are not enough for an emergency. So some redundancy, it's, uh, it's really, really warranted uh, during uh, um, such pandemic. And finally, preparedness. Preparedness uh, is such a word that in Italian, um, doesn't have uh, a proper translation. <laughs> so it, it means that we are not uh, used uh, to be prepared, but uh, we need for, to do that, uh, to have a very efficient preparedness plan and to be prepared uh, to be resilient. So thank you for uh, your attention and I'm available for uh, any question. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very you. much, Professor Lopalco. I have a question for uh, Professor Lopalco, if, it is, if we have time. Martina? Yes, here, here I am. Yes, I have a question for Professor Lopalco. Of, of course, okay. of course, of course. So I heard you, I have a question, so I just left you the floor, but of uh, course, okay. please go ahead. I would like to thank again Professor Lopalco for uh, his very interesting speech. Professor Opalco, you know, resilience, preparedness of our society, of our political and administrative systems. I think that today is a, a very important point that let, let me to say that we'll work together with sustainability, sustainability and resilience of our society. I think that are two very important issues. What is your point of view? regarding the uh, relationship regard for, between resilience, not only from the pandemic point of view, but you know, uh, we, we, we have, uh, um, uh, I don't know, you know, some very important natural disasters, very uh, important uh, meteorological uh, uh, issues and so on. What is the relationship between uh, an overall resilience of the uh, of our society of our 
organizations and uh, uh, you know uh, what ca can be a new development, a new vision of our political systems? This is, this is not, not a simple question. <laughs> I, I agree, I agree. I agree that uh, uh, resilience must be uh, uh, eventually after this disaster, because pandemic uh, was a real disaster. After the disaster, resilience should be in the political agenda. And uh, resilience, uh, again, uh, it is not just uh, uh, waiting on the beach uh, for the tsunami wave. You are not, uh, you, you must not wait on the beach. Uh, uh, you must be prepared for the tsunami, tsunami wave. And to be prepared for the tsunami wave, it means not only uh, to have uh, uh, the emergency hospital that of course uh, we will try to keep uh, no, like a fire extinguisher, but uh, uh, you have to be resilient uh, in your uh, overall economic tissue and uh, economic thread. Um, I, I mean, our uh, the, the the world economy crashed just because we stopped flying. No, you stop fly, and the world economy crashes. So, uh, of course, there is something wrong in that. Uh, um, resilience means uh, rethinking the whole system. So, uh, I, of course, uh, it is very hard to make a plan. It is very hard to also to, to synthesize uh, these uh, issues. But uh, again, I fully agree that resilience should be part of the political agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Professor Lopalco for this uh, comprehensive and interesting and strategic also uh, presentation of the uh, situation at the Puglia region. And thanks, Professor Ficarella, for adding another uh, element to this conversation. Uh, I have to say it was very interesting. So, and also to the uh, stories that we hear about other regions in Italy. Um, and of course, uh, to put it in connection with the experiences we have heard from other regions of the world and from other um, stories uh, of uh, Europe, at least. Um, so if there are no other questions, uh, I would uh, go on with, uh, with our webinar and uh, start with the with the round table we have invited some uh, stakeholders whether they're private or public uh, to share their their insights about um, the pandemic and the pandemic management and health infrastructures and the, the the main topic of our conversation today so first of i would like to uh, welcome uh, our four um, guests and I would ask them to uh, introduce themselves for the audience and uh, share a little bit of uh, their role and what they, uh, they, uh, what they do uh, in relation of the, also of this, of course, uh, the topic of the, of the event today. So first of uh, in my list, uh, and I'm very proud and very happy to welcome her is uh, Salma Buktawa from the uh, Libyan International Medical University. Uh, Salma, I'm very happy to have you with us today. I've seen you connect since the very second, and so I'm very happy to welcome you on board. Uh, would you mind to introduce yourself and just give a few, uh, a brief presentation of your university? Uh, okay, um, thanks, Ma thanks Martina for uh, inviting me uh, to attend this meeting today. I am from uh, Libyan International Medical University, which is located in Benghazi uh, city. Uh, I am Dean Faculty of Pharmacy at the university. Uh, it's the first private uh, medical uh, university in the country, uh, and it adopts um, active learning strategies. Uh, so it works in, in academically in a totally uh, different way than other uh, medical schools 
we have plenty of medical schools uh, in the country. Um, uh, I don't know if, uh, if you want me to, uh, to talk a little bit or give a brief about the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, and what happened in Libya, I am willing to, to give a few points if you don't mind. Of course, of course, we have okay. that. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, thank you. Because I, what I noticed from the presentations, uh, you know, people talked about the, you know, the vaccination booking systems. Uh, they talked about, you know, plenty of very advanced stuff. But, you know, actually, um, in Libya, the situation is a little bit different. Uh, I don't, uh, I think Dr. or Professor uh, Tomasi at the beginning was talking about, um, uh, you know, we don't have to um, throw everything on the security uh, and uh, the instability. Uh, we don't have to blame those. But I don't know, I have to say uh, in Libya, loads of problems, uh, internal security problem, political problems or even you can call it crisis economic crisis and then we had this uh, covid-19 uh, infrastructure was very weak at the beginning uh, and uh, you know um, people tried to do their best the united you know who tried to support united nations as well you know they try through united nations development uh, programs to support the people uh, we had uh, a vaccination booking system started at the beginning and people you know very few people used this booking system uh, and when the vaccines uh, arrived to Libya. Actually, we were one of the last countries in the region to uh, receive vaccines, okay? Uh, the responsibility was on our own authorities, the Libyan authorities. They were very late in their responses, and that's why we were one, as I said, of the late countries to receive vaccines. But when the booking system worked, uh, you know, very, and uh, the vaccines arrived and start to ask people to come to health institutions to, to vaccinate. No one want to, vac to, to, to vaccinate, you know, to receive vaccines. People, um, you know, they got some type of fear. I don't know. Uh, they, they refused all types. We, we received different types of vaccines from different origins but the numbers are different as well. And no one want to receive vaccines. You know, some vaccines expired and thrown without people receiving them. And, uh, you know, after that, you know, maybe with the work and support of WHO and UN, all these programs, uh, you know, maybe the awareness of the people, maybe the increased number of the, uh, you know, uh, infected people in the country, people started to uh, go, you know, and ask for vaccines. Actually, the booking system stopped because no one followed that booking system. So uh, Ministry of Health said, or announced that if anyone want to vaccinate, just go to the nearest health institution and receive his vaccines. People, you know, after some time, people started to go and receive their vaccines. But the other problem we are facing currently, that you receive the first dose of your vaccine, but you can't find and you cannot guarantee that you will get your second dose because it's not available. For example, people received Sputnik uh, 5, you know, a few months ago, uh, you know, maybe they, some people exceeded four months now, and just yesterday, and maybe this week, we started to receive the second dose, you know, of Sputnik 5. So, uh, you know, for some vaccines, people receive first dose and not second dose. And that's why you can find this even, you know, reflected in the number of vaccinated people. Like, you know, the total population in Libya is around 7 million. The people who received first dose of the vaccine, the total number until today is 1,246,000 uh, uh, and 200, uh, you know, people. So it's only 1 million and 2,000 people, 200,000 people, okay? And the people who received the second dose, they are only 1,035,000 people. Can you imagine? 
135,000 people. Only uh, this is the number who received two doses of the uh, vaccine. Uh, you know, um, in the neighbor, you know, neighbor countries also, like uh, maybe in Tunisia, uh, the, the situation is a little bit stable during the last few weeks, but in Egypt it's not, and we have those cross points, so in Egypt this increases and this affects Libya as well, and maybe that reflects as well why in Benghazi and Derna, uh, I mean, in the eastern region of Libya, where I am, uh, our university is located, there is an increased number of uh, infected people uh, lately. Uh, okay, as I said, the WHO and health partners prioritized, you know, with the authorities, health authorities, uh, technical areas for improvement. They also uh, try to support public institutions, local governments, uh, because they started even while we were had two governments working at the same time in the country. They support the civil societies, communities. They try to do rehabilitation work in hospitals and medical centers across the country. Uh, they start to do, uh, you know, to offer uh, some strategic uh, medical uh, equipment and maybe as well they help in building uh, some isolation rooms uh, in a few hospitals and also um, um, they try to assist in the design of uh, you know some medical uh, oxygen plants uh, you know people are trying to be dedicated to, to support us uh, also um, Ministry of Justice were supported to control COVID-19 in prisons and other stuff. You know, lately, uh, not, as I said, no people were encouraged to take vaccines. This 1 million uh, people, 1 million 2,000, uh, 200,000 people who received first dose, this number is, uh, you know, um, has been, you know, formed during the last uh, maybe two months, not less than. Before that, no one was receiving vaccines, but also, uh, you know, this has happened uh, after, uh, you know, those large campaigns of vaccination have been uh, established in the country. Uh, all numbers uh, can be taken uh, and we can follow from the National Center for Disease Control uh, in Libya, uh, but also the National Center itself is suffering from the streaming of the information to it. Uh, maybe it got, uh, you know, accurate numbers from the uh, Western part or West region of the country, but they can't receive, uh, you know, accurate number from the eastern or the southern part of the country. Um, hopefully, I, I tried to explain how is the situation, how is the infrastructure, um, and, um, and thank you for giving me this opportunity, and if anyone has any questions, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sama, for, for telling us about the story of uh, the Libyan, uh, of what's happening in, in Libya. And also uh, you have introduced a number of topics which I would like also to discuss with the other stakeholders we invited for the round table. You talked about um, vaccination campaigns, so how to communicate, you talked about infrastructures, uh, about the availability of the authorities in managing the process. And also um, you introduced the uh, resistance, uh, in uh, not resistance, but yes, in terms of the uh, people not willing to to get vaccinated, despite the importance. And this is a topic we hear very well, at least here in Italy. Um, so thanks for sharing your experience, but also for introducing some of the elements uh, I would like to um, hear in this uh, conversation. So the other uh, guests uh, in our roundtable are uh, Martina Castiglioni from the uh, Risks and Security Management Consultant uh, at the KPMG in Italy. So um, uh, welcome on board and um, be happy to have you. I'm happy to have you here. And then it's Gaia Pavan, the Risk Manager from the FNM in Italy and Andrea Praetano, Cybersecurity and Privacy Advisory Manager at the Matic Mind, again, from Italy. So 
Um, welcome on board. Um, I would like to, you as well to introduce yourself and to introduce your role and what you're doing and the, the institution you're coming with, the organization you're coming from. And if you can also share your experience and your insights and an opinion about uh, the management tools uh, needed in times of a pandemic and what was your experience um, with the uh, pandemic management uh, recently. So, um, Martina, <laughs> the floor is yours, and then Gaia, and then Andrea. Martina, thanks for inviting, me, for inviting me here today, and thanks for all the contribution that I heard here today. It's really interesting for me. Um, yes, I'm Martina Castiglioni. Uh, I'm working for KPMG Italy. Uh, the line of services is called the Information Risk Management, and uh, um, I support the organization from different business sector uh, in uh, uh, the prevention, the reaction, uh, and the management of cybersecurity risk, information security risk, and uh, data protection issues. Um, in particular, I mainly work for the so-called uh, operators of essential services, um, in particular in the sector of energy, health, uh, water, and transport sector, uh, performing cyber risk assessment, uh, defining uh, cybersecurity strategies uh, and also performing operational technology analysis. Um, and uh, uh, in the last two, three years, I worked in particular for uh, supporting them in the compliance with the NIS directive and nowadays uh, in, for the compliance of the so-called Italian National Cybersecurity Perimeter, that is a, a, a specific Italian law that is like the evolution, let's say like this, uh, of the NIS directive. Um, uh, I don't know how much time do I have, Martina, for um, my, my um, contribution. We have um, half an hour left for this uh, stakeholder roundtable and uh, some time for questions, if any. So I would say 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. So uh, could I uh, share the slide? Of that course, of it's course. only one slide. Okay. Uh, I think uh, it should work. Let me know if you have any trouble with that. No. Mm, okay. Give me one second. Oh, um, I'm not able, actually, I don't know how, why it's not working, but I, 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 I really, I, I don't want to waste time, so I will proceed, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, or if you have the, the, the slide, could you kindly share? Okay. I don't have. Um, okay, it seems it should it should be working, but now we can't see you either. <laughs> um, if you want, I can you can send the slide to me. I'll just share the address in the chat, and I will I'll just yeah. share it with the group. Okay, just sent. Um, so I will proceed. Okay. Um, so yeah, today here, uh, considering what I saw in the critical infrastructure environment, uh, um, I will bring uh, a quick overview of the significant impact, impact of this uh, um, unprecedented operational disruption represented by COVID-19 in terms of cybersecurity risk and in particular cybersecurity governance. Trying to highlight takeaway strategies to you know, keep adapting to this new normal. Um, and so we all knew that, uh, we all know that uh, well, these last two years have been uh, unlikely testing time for us all. Uh, nobody was fully prepared to tackle this situation and putting this uh, unpreparedness, let's say from a governance perspective, um, business continuity plan built so far, built by the organization, including critical infrastructure, 
were not meant to react from, uh, uh, from this uh, unprecedented operational threat and uh, withstand operational shock and continue to deliver the essential services. Of course, uh, I'm speaking here um, considering my experience for uh, operator of essential services, in particular for energy and transport sector. Uh, in particular, the most, the most stressed area um, for, from an operational point of view were business continuity management and information and cybersecurity. Uh, why information and cybersecurity in terms of straightening technical countermeasure to protect the personal data and information against the potential new and evolving cyber threat. Uh, there was this necessity to increase the attention about the cyber threat that instead were underestimated before. In fact, the current operating context is changed because, of course, it's characterized by a series of peculiar elements that affect the loss of visibility and the control over the company perimeter and reduce the intervention and containment capacity. Indeed, they increase hugely the risk of exposure to cyber type threat, which if should they occur, they could significantly threaten also business continuity. And I'm not speaking only about uh, as the most physical, uh, visible factors such as uh, the use of remote working, but also the reduction of countermeasures for a measure flexibilities of the provision of the services that can be uh, a normal during uh, the pandemic time. Coming to critical infrastructure, in particular, my main example here derived from uh, sorry, experience in energy sector, the pandemic management highlighted the two main complex features that the critical infrastructure have to face during a crisis like that. First of all, the bound of the organization between dependencies and interdependencies, often with the other critical infrastructure. And the other future is the human-centered approach that characterizes the majority of the process that provide the essential services. Of course, uh, the essential services, the operator of essential services had a security plan already, already, um, already set up and implemented that were in place even before the COVID-19, but such a security plan were not capable to manage an event of such a range and, su and such impact. Also because it was not so clear and far and analyzed in the previous security plan, uh, the cybersecurity impact, impact and uh, the overall um, consequences in, in terms of uh, personal security, in terms of information security and data protection. Um, the short-term response uh, uh, had to envisage the following, the, the, the activities that uh, I just, uh, um, I, I is in the, in the, um, in the right part uh, of, uh, in the right side of this uh, slide. And uh, we could start from uh, the, you know, the confirmation and identification of critical processes that have to be protected to guarantee the continuity of the essential services. And the identification of those processes that can be performed at home. And this can be performed in an efficient way only if a risk assessment process is in place and updated. And if a business impact analysis, analysis have been performed to clearly identify and prioritize a site, processes and services, and also the third parties involved. Uh, with a business impact analysis, and I'm referring to the standard methodology under ISO 22301 that envisage all, also a critical scenario, such as the COVID-19, it is possible um, clearly identify the standard continuous activities, such as maintenance, that can be reduced at one specific minimum level, just with the aim to guarantee the continuity of the services. Of course, um, this means also identify, from the other hand, which process can cease during the emergencies in order to deliver a minimal uh, viable product. This has to be identified considering also the mobility and geographical constraints, such as the dislocated maintenance activities. Um, another um, strategic activities in the in, um, critical activities in the short term during the, um, the pandemic uh, was the identification of the minimum number of personnel to be, to be present, uh, that have to be present in site plan and uh, in the control room, for example. The solution was mainly the identification of fixed teams, uh, just like two work teams, uh, working in different turns, uh, avoiding the physical interaction between different teams. And here, one criticality is because the control room has to be always managed. 
Uh, this means the difficulties, for example, in finding the proper time to clean and sanitize the control room after the, after the turn of one team and before the entrance of another team. So the windy strategy here is connected with the diversification of the building environment, also having a cyber physical view, because from one end, the windy, stra the windy strategies could be connected to disaster recovery site. In which term? Uh, I mean, to minimize the infection between different teamwork, it could be possible to activate the another control room that is represented, for example, by the disaster recovery site. In this way, two teams can be working different time slots without never met each other. But this is possible where the disaster recovery infrastructure admit this, this solution. Uh, so where we have the so-called hot disaster recovery. From the other end, it could be possible to identify and dedicate specific building areas for the operators of the control room to work from a different front end. So not duplicate the control room and activate the, uh, the disaster recovery site, uh, but uh, uh, just activate other, uh, others and different from front end. Front end. Um, and when these two uh, first solutions were impossible, the teamwork uh, performed uh, uh, turns of 14 days, and after this turn, the member of the team stayed quarantined for 40 days before coming back to work. So these uh, uh, were the uh, three different uh, um, scenarios that uh, uh, that we saw um, in order to uh, to respond to uh, the, um, the availabilities and the risk of uh, um, of uh, having uh, not having enough personnel. Um, of course, the solution could be different considering the available and planning resource, also in terms of technology strategies, as we saw with the example of the disaster recovery. Uh, as we all know, um, another short-term strategy was remote working, but this meant not only identifying the tools to work remotely, but also analyze and increase, if necessary, the security requirement. For example, access management, network communication, based, of course, on an IT risk-based approach, uh, identify secure ad hoc uh, collaboration environment, and, of course, uh, educate personnel. So identify specific rules and let the personnel aware about the cyber threat and best practices to put in practice every day uh, during their business as usual, their new business as usual at home. Another characteristic of the personnel when we, when we, uh, when we are talking about critical infrastructure in the energy sector, for example, is the personnel highly, is that the personnel is highly specialized. So the pandemic strategy showed a, the lack of redundancy in terms of competencies. Um, and also this threat can be identified performing a business impact analysis because the human resources is a, a pivotal element of one business impact analysis under uh, the um, ISO 20. Zero one methodology. Um, so from uh, now on, uh, we know that all the organization, including critical infrastructure, um, will have to keep uh, performing these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, activities and these uh, short-term activities and uh, strategies that they perform at the very beginning of the pandemic time. But uh, um, uh, with the critical infrastructure, we have to adopt a new standard uh, driven by their experiences while, um, during the responding to COVID-19. And so which lesson learned can we summarize? Considering cyber risk assessment methodology and process. Of course, there is a need to reperform and update the cyber risk assessment, considering new tools introduced during the crisis time. Reperform the analysis given a proper likelihood level to risk scenarios related not only to pandemic, but also to biohazard and the human safety and environmental risk scenarios in order to build an holistic view of risk, not only focus on system and assets, uh, IT or OT assets, because this could be extremely helpful. Um, this could be extremely helpful, for example, in the context of emerging hybrid threat scenarios. Uh, and consider the characteristic that I mentioned before, uh, uh, the characteristics that uh, are key features of the critical infrastructure, um, regarding the huge dependencies and interdependencies, uh, often with other critical infrastructure, uh, why not enrich uh, a common cybersecurity risk analysis with a clear understanding of the interconnection of our assets in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, systematic level interdependencies? 
Um, so the access to scenarios uh, that uh, indirectly affect affecting other critical infrastructure, taking into consideration the, dependence among, uh, the dependencies among the assets, the assets, but also the critical infrastructure. Um, this helps uh, equalizing dependencies while exploiting inter inter interdependencies in terms of attack vectors, because of course, these can show, uh, these can show us new vulnerabilities and new, uh, new risk scenarios, new, um, new, attack, uh, um, new attack vectors. Um, and uh, so introduce uh, like uh, the dependency assessment in the, in the normal risk assessment. Um, and um, identifying these different synergies and dependencies uh, among uh, the elements of the risk scenarios, among the different actors of the risk scenarios, um, it will be possible uh, automatically identify the so-called domino effect uh, and also be prepared for hybrid risk and hybrid threat events. From an organizational point of view, uh, of course, uh, these, uh, uh, the pandemic lesson um, um, bring, uh, bring us uh, the, the, the fact that, that we have to develop and validate a pandemic plan um, annually. Uh, and the, the, the pandemic plan should be integrated in the business continuity plan and should be validated through tabletop exercise, functional exercise and test in order to you know, let the personnel understand their roles and responsibilities validate critical business processes um, and uh, uh, also develop and partner customize for the specific organization communication tools and not only for external but also for internal for internal uh, stakeholders considering the, um, the, the pre predefined business continuity and the pandemic plan um, I tried to 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 be to be faster, uh, sorry, but uh, I I was checking any time the um, the time. Sorry. No worries. Uh, it was indeed a very comprehensive and uh, um, yes, it was interesting. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand everything you said, but I think one of the key elements of, in your presentation was this inter, interdependency and, and interconnection of so many aspects in relation to the pandemic management infrastructure and the risk management and so on. So thank you very much. It was very interesting, even for a non-expert in the, in the field. Um, so next in line is uh, Gaia Pavan. Uh, so please, Gaia, take the floor and uh, um, we are willing to hear uh, your experience with, with the pandemic and the experience of your organization. Thanks a lot to invite me there. And I want to bring uh, with you uh, our experience. Uh, I started to work in Ferrovia Nord Milano during the pandemic. For us, it was a very, for me and for the enterprise, the holding was a very strange moment to start work there. Uh, we uh, worked in uh, a double uh, scenario because uh, we have uh, 14 enterprises in the holding. We have uh, more than uh, 3,000 uh, uh, employees and we have to uh, manage the safety and security also the users of the public uh, transportation in all of kind because we manage uh, uh, ATV and La Linea that uh, uh, work in the public transportation of Verona, a very beautiful city of north of Italy, and uh, uh, all the people that uh, work, uh, work and use the uh, train in the suburbs and near the, of Milan. Uh, inside uh, the enterprise, we work uh, creating uh, some specific rules, uh, managing uh, PPE uh, for uh, all the employees, and uh, trying to create uh, some different place uh, to work. One of big step uh, forward that we made was uh, uh, the smart working, because uh, our enterprise don't have uh, uh, for all the employees the smart working and uh, one of uh, this step forward was uh, to create and managing all the um, 
the smart working for all the employees. Uh, this uh, uh, brings us in a very different uh, situation because uh, for us, uh, uh, the cybersecurity from home uh, was uh, uh, something that we don't manage because people don't do smart working. And uh, this was developed in uh, the last two years. In the other way, we have the safety and security of the people that using the means of transport. And in this case, uh, we adopt uh, some different uh, waves uh, and measure to um, making secure the people that use this. Uh, in this case, uh, we install uh, in uh, the bus and the train, uh, the dispenser, dispenser of sanitized gel and uh, the uh, physical barriers from the people that use the means of transport and uh, the people that uh, um, manage the means, of, the means of transport. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, we are creating a project also to um, trying to redevelop a sort of consciousness and uh, um, in the users of means of transport, because for us it was a very um, difficult situation and uh, we have a lot of losses during these two years because people prefer to use uh, private means of transport during the pandemic and uh, we know all uh, why. And uh, in uh, this case, uh, uh, we are managing uh, some project with Astra, that uh, is the association of uh, transportation, that uh, our president is the president also the Astra Association. And uh, um, we are trying developing this new means uh, of thinking the local transportation, new way of uh, um, try to be responsible also the user of the means of transport using a uh, mask and sanitary gel and uh, to uh, make a good idea of the means of transport that are not uh, uh, one of the way to uh, contract the coronavirus virus. And uh, this is a very uh, big step uh, for us. In the other way to manage the crisis, uh, um, in this case, uh, the pandemic, but also the other, we have uh, created a crisis committee to manage uh, in all the way from uh, all the employees to the top management, uh, all kind of crisis. We create the BIA uh, and uh, uh, a business continuity team that uh, try to manage this uh, in uh, all the time. We um, try to manage also risk assessment via and business continuity activity during all the day during the year. Um, I think that uh, this is our experience. We are proud of uh, what we trying to do also for our employee and for uh, the users of uh, the means of transport that uh, we manage. I don't know if a Someone have some question or uh, more in detail in uh, something that I said. I'm sorry for my English, I know, but uh, <laughs> in our enterprise, English is not uh, so used. No, no, do not apologize. It was very nice <laughs> to hear your experience and actually to see another perspective about how to manage the risk within an organization. So how to deal with, with the practical aspects of uh, yes, yeah, so it the, the, was the a very big uh, uh, task for us uh, because uh, uh, pandemic start with uh, uh, in uh, nineteen uh, in twenty ninety one, and uh, they managed before the the first part of employees, and after when they see that uh, this uh, could be uh, also an economic crisis and uh, have a lot of losses for us, uh, uh, start with uh, start creating uh, with uh, the crisis committee to also manage the uh, economical crisis for us. Of course, and I think if there is um, among the many lessons that we learned from the pandemic is that you never know what's coming next. So they prepared the nest. That's what uh, has been said many times during the webinar. You know, it's, uh, it's the matter of being prepared. So to 
to or at least uh, to um, have the instruments to uh, cope with the emergency. We, you don't know what to expect. You don't know what's coming next, but trying to be prepared and try to have the instrument to assess the risks and assess and manage um, what's coming, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not to be underestimated. On the contrary, it's something we have to pay attention to. Yes, the main lesson is that there is, doesn't exist the zero risk. Yes, that's true. Also, the more improbable risk could be happen. <laughs> Yes, yes, that's true, that's true. So thank you, Gaia, for your time and for being with us today. Um, thank you. So I would give the floor to our last but not least speaker, which is Andrea Praitano. So please, Andrea, the floor is yours. Hello, Happy can to you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, I'll try to share my screen now. It's working it. Uh, do you see my screen now? Yes. yes. I prepared some slide that will explain some uh, security aspect uh, uh, contextualizing the healthcare um, context. Just uh, a couple of words of me on me <clears throat> and my company. Uh, I'm Andrea Pretano, and uh, I'm the IT or T Cybersecurity and Privacy Advisory Manager in MarkMind. Uh, my department is located in the Security Competence Center in MathMind, and the main uh, activities for my team uh, is to support uh, uh, MathMind customers uh, for the compliance uh, to evaluate the security posture level uh, um, and understand in general way, understand uh, what. Uh, uh, security measures are needed to implement in the organization. Uh, MathMind is an uh, Italian system integrator. We operate in, in Italy in, uh, with a lot of sector uh, in the care sector, uh, public administration, and so on. Uh, we also uh, work uh, in some uh, funding projects at European level and uh, Italian level, in particular that uh, include some uh, healthcare scenario uh, was uh, in Talisman, uh, in Defend and Vision. Um, just uh, uh, to move to the main topic of my presentation. The, the healthcare uh, sector uh, are, uh, is a, a target for hackers. It's, uh, we say the, uh, some other presentation uh, was, for example, the um, Lazio region attack uh, to the system, but also there are a lot of uh, attack to Italian healthcare organization, uh, but also in the European level and the world level. Uh, the healthcare sector is uh, uh, one of the most uh, target uh, for the for hackers. Um, it's, uh, there is a not a, a real statistics, uh, but uh, based on my experience in the last year, uh, the number of organizations that, uh, that were attacked by hacker, uh, for example, through ransomware, uh, was increased. Uh, we, in the last year, we received a lot of uh, uh, support requests uh, for the incident response team to ransomware attack. I don't know if this uh, uh, increase, this change is connected uh, to the pandemic. I don't know if the hacker are in smart working, uh, it's more easy to attack the organization. But in any case, in the last year, this number was increased. The, the healthcare sector, it's uh, a, a, a strange, it's not a usual, uh, a usual sector. Uh, the death uh, care is uh, a, a promiscuous environment. It is a traditional uh, uh, activity between uh, medical staff and patients. There is a uh, um, remote support to patients. This uh, functionality was increased in the, during the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, to support uh, and follow the COVID and not COVID uh, patients at home. Uh, there are also the the normal IT uh, service environment to support the medical analysis and 
to control uh, the facets uh, in, uh, in the bed in the hospital. The environment in hospital uh, usually have three different uh, environment. There is an enterprise system for the, for example, for the administrative uh, system in the hospital. There is the medical uh, environment that are more connected to the patients to control and uh, support the patients uh, on the bed. Uh, but also there is a consumer uh, scenario because the patients, uh, the family of patients, friends, uh, and but also the medical staff uh, use the personal uh, mobile device in the hospital and are usually are connected to the, the guest Wi-Fi connection. And that this is an important issue for the security in the, in the hospital scenario. There is um, one important uh, question. Are the Internet of Medical Things hospital and the health records secure? Obviously, there is not a uh, unique answer because it's, it's connected to the specific uh, healthcare organization, the specific hospital. But in a general way, the answer is not. Is it no? The Internet of Medical Thing, the hospital, in general way, the systems in the, the hospital are not have not a, a high level of security level. From a security point of view, it's uh, the security. It's easy. It's uh, the if we uh, follow the uh, attack attacker point of view, it's uh, the attacker can try to violate the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of the information or system. And from the uh, security point of view, we try to protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the system and information. This is. Um, the, the, the security is not only uh, connected to the attacker, to the hacker. For, for example, uh, uh, I take, uh, I, I see a, a very interesting uh, slide in the Professor Lopalco presentation. In that slide, uh, the professor showed that the ICU beds uh, number was increased in Puglia in Puglia region from 50 to around 350 uh, beds in, uh, in very short time. It's important that uh, I'm not a very expert of uh, ICT, uh, ICU uh, functionality and uh, ICT system to support the ICU beds, but probably there is a, a connection to a local screen. Uh, there is necessary a connection to a centralized wallpaper dashboard to control uh, the, the patients. And uh, these uh, increasing uh, the, this number in a very short time have uh, a, a, a probably have a, a very important uh, impact on the availability of the infrastructure. The ICT infrastructure was designed for this uh, number of connections, this uh, uh, traffic in the, in the network. This is an important uh, issue in the design stage. Uh, usually we use the confidentiality and availability, but also the resilience. Uh, the resilience is a very important uh, point for the security. Uh, but uh, uh, um, I agree with the Professor uh, Lopalco conclusion about the residence, but there is an, from my point of view, there is a very important point for the residence. Residence is a multi multidisciplinary sector. It's not only the resilience from the medical uh, services, uh, but also it's the resilience for the medical infrastructure, for the medical staff, for the building, for the ICT infrastructure, for the ICT services. It's important that they design the right level of resilience for the full chain in the, in the, in the, in the services. It's necessary to work together with the medical staff, the administration staff, but also the, the suppliers. Um, 
we, we had some problem with our uh, customers uh, in some hospitals uh, that are particularly customers with the pandemic uh, situation because of the, 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 the hospital is uh, critical services uh, and that was uh, operative for the full time. But also the ICT company that are service provider for these uh, for the hospitals uh, are, are critical. Uh, we organize our uh, te te technician uh, with the, the same uh, level of uh, safety safety um, uh, devices for for work in the hospital for support the server support the medical staff uh, for for the normal activities. This uh, usually the, the normal uh, security scenario is the violation of confidentiality and availability in the healthcare domain. It's to lose the confidentiality, to uh, copy, the hacker copy the information from the database and uh, sell in the black market or try to um, block the system to, um, uh, to uh, for for those attacks, for example, uh, in the last um, years, uh, last couple of years, uh, the scenario was uh, drastically changing the healthcare sector. There, uh, there are some uh, uh, malware specific design for uh, healthcare sector that uh, try to manipulate the uh, medical result. This is a picture uh, that it's a malware that uh, inject uh, some uh, information uh, in the CT scan and uh, include some uh, a, a fake information uh, of a Sony pulmonary virus in these uh, CT scans. There are, in, in, this, uh, in this picture, there is the same uh, in the inclusion of uh, nodules. Uh, uh, 472 uh, nodules in this uh, CT scan, but also there are some malware remove uh, information from the medical uh, data. Um, this university did a, a very interesting uh, research. There are a lot of medical staff that uh, are not able to identify, identify the fake information in this medical result. The, the scenario in the healthcare system was a radical change with this kind of attack at the medical systems. Uh, I take this um, some uh, picture from the ENISA uh, guidelines uh, for the smart hospital. Uh, it's not very recent, uh, this, uh, this um, guidelines, but uh, I think it's uh, actual with the, the, the information. Mm, the hospital. Uh, you are more experienced. You you have more experience of me in the hospital, uh, but uh, the hospital in general way are changing, uh, uh, are moving from traditional uh, uh, services to a smart uh, hospital. Um, this change uh, the asset necessary for the smart hospital. Uh, and uh, now we are we talk about uh, with the IT manager or security manager in the hospital. We usually we talk about remote care system, mobile client devices, signification system, uh, building networking, uh, network and medical devices, uh, interconnected, interconnected clinical information system, and obviously with the data. The criticality of this uh, system is not the, these uh, assets are not the same. The most critical from the uh, uh, guidelines uh, is uh, the interconnected clean information system and the network and medical devices, uh, uh, network equipment, uh, remote care system, and the others. Um, some, uh, some conclusion from this uh, very short uh, presentation. The security issue, cyber security issue in the hospital. The most important point is the follow up, the security by design, data protection by design, in general, with the GDPR indication when uh, uh, we are developing, a, a, for example, telemedicine, telehealth care platform. 
uh, for example, we, we follow this, um, this approach during uh, the Talisman project and the Vision uh, project. The second important point is uh, to use best practice. Uh, there are a lot of best practice that uh, show um, present information about the uh, main vulnerability in the system, the main, uh, the, the main uh, approach to increase the security level. Uh, it's uh, important to use uh, best practice to increase the the security possible level in the organization. Uh, it's important best practice when we design uh, the ICT infrastructure, and it's important to design uh, the ICT infrastructure uh, uh, thinking the uh, resilience uh, of the information, and we, it's necessary to design the infrastructure have in mind the peak level, uh, for example, in the pandemic. Uh, from the, this is an important uh, lesson learned from the pandemic uh, situation. Another important uh, point uh, for increase the security level uh, in, the, in the hospital sector is the awareness and training to the uh, not technical uh, people. So, a doc, in the hospital, there are a lot of doctors. The IT department, the security department, usually a very small department in the hospital. It's important to increase the security and privacy awareness in the medical staff, staff not in the IT staff or technical staff. Because usually the, the, the doctor, the nurse, the physiotherapist manage the uh, information, the sensitive information, information uh, are, they are the main target from the attacker for the phishing campaign, for social engineering attack, and so on. The, the last uh, important point from my point of view is that uh, in this moment uh, we are in the in, in the middle of uh, a, a project. You know, because uh, we have a smart uh, hospital, but uh, we have a lot of uh, old tools, old systems in the hospital. Usually we have uh, innovative services, for example, telemedicine uh, system, but these uh, new systems are connected with the old system. This is the last uh, point. I finish. Thank you for, thanks for your attention. I don't know if you have some questions. Thanks a lot, um, Andrea, for your presentation and for sharing the experience of your um, of your company and, and, and your work. Um, again, I'm not an expert, but it, it, it has been very interesting for me all along those this webinar to hear so many different perspectives, so many different experiences, and so many similarities as well in the management of, of a crisis, of a pandemic, even if we hope it's one life case, uh, and, uh, and, and in general, the management of the health infrastructures. Um, not sure if uh, uh, there are questions for our speakers. It's been more than two, almost three hours we are connected now, so I think we are all pretty tired, but um, I'm happy to see some faces which stayed connected for the old time. I think it was a very, very interesting conversation and event. Uh, Professor Ficarella, I'm not sure if you want to share a final word or if no other questions are. Um... Yeah, I will. If there are no other questions, well, I, I would like to thank you, to thank to everybody. Uh, for this very interesting uh, uh, talk about this very relevant problem. And uh, as I told you, I hope we will have room for next uh, webinars and for next common activities. In the mainframe of the sub-network and of the UNIMED organization, of course. I would like to thank you, Martina, for your uh, very important uh, organization and coordination of the meeting and also of course uh, to Marcello Scalisi 
for this to give us this opportunity. Thank you, Professor. And uh, again, a, a great thank to all uh, the colleagues which uh, have joined us uh, today. Um, if you all agree, I would be very happy to share each other contacts. Um, I've seen some emails in the chat and I will be happy to share uh, the presentations, but as well the contacts. So to, for this to be an occasion um, of further conversation, just a starting point uh, of discussions and common research and, and common exchange on the topic and also on other um, related projects. So uh, I'll be very happy uh, if you agree to share um, all the resources, the recording and the contacts, so that this is, uh, again, this is the occasion to start the conversation and not to end the conversation. So again, uh, thank you uh, all and I wish you all a good evening and uh, hope to see you again and to talk to you again in the future occasion of the Seven Network. So greetings from UNIMED and from Rome and Italy and See you in the next occasion, everyone. Okay. Thank okay. You. See you. See you. See you. Thank bye. You so much. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.